part two of module two is still on the recent vulnerability assessment and analysis, but now we will be focusing more on vulnerability assessment. In part one, we talk more about the different steps of the risk assessment process, but in this part two, we will be focusing more on vulnerability. How do we assess it? especially adopting an indicator-based approach to that, using different indicators, using different dimensions. Before coming to the assessment of vulnerability, we would like to, to look at the concept of vulnerability. Though we, we introduced the concept briefly in module one, we want to show how complex it is and how, uh, it's very broad and how different disciplines adopt different approaches to vulnerability. In fact, different areas give different definition of the term vulnerability. It's there in the handout. There is a table there which gives you the different areas with different definition of vulnerability. What we've seen over the years, however, is that vulnerability has become more a multidimensional concept, right? Which of course make it more complex. And it's complex, yes, but also in terms of skill, scale, it's very broad, yeah? And from that diagram, you will see that it's moved from being an internal risk factor to being like the definition being from a likelihood to experience harm or as a multiple structure where we talk about coping capacity, exposure and adaptive capacity, which I did earlier. Remember in when we talk about the different dimensions, the different elements there uh, in vulnerability, we talk about capacity, exposure, adaptive capacity especially as well as coping capacity. But what we will be doing in that part of module two is looking at the multidimensional vulnerability where we, we factor in different dimensions. That is physical, social, economic, environmental, institutional. Sometimes you have other dimensions being added to that cultural etc you can include other dimension based on the specificity of your country uh, in module three we will talk about additional dimensions which can be added to cover the multi-dimensionality of the vulnerability concept which of course make it more complex and more difficult to measure but which are very important to capture specificities of countries. To make it simple, we will look at four types of vulnerability. That is four dimensions to it. First is physical vulnerability. It looks more at the built-in environment, right, and the infrastructure, what are the impact of shocks on, on the building environment, on the population, damage to buildings, damage to houses, uh, damage to hospitals, uh, schools, etc., to any kind of infrastructure. So then uh, the extent of this loss can be like, uh, within a given magnitude that is ranging from zero where there is no damage or one where there is total damage. So this is physical vulnerability. The other one is economic vulnerability. The impacts of threats could be on economic assets, right? For instance, uh, loss of jobs, right? Unemployment, loss of income, increased poverty, or business closing down, economic sectors doing worse compared to before, yeah? Social vulnerability is the impact of hazard on particular groups of people. We mentioned them a lot, 
like those uh, being vulnerable, like youth, women, elderly, refugees, migrant workers, single parent household, children, and they may face acute poverty or injuries, fatalities, or there could be psychological impact on them, which they encounter. Environmental vulnerability will be more on the impacts on the environment, the ecosystem being affected by diversity or loss of cultural diversity as well. So these are the different types of vulnerability which may occur. But there are other studies which have added other types of vulnerability, like uh, institutional, etc. So this could this list could be extended further. We did mention that vulnerability is a dynamic concept; it changes. In fact. Exposure and vulnerability are, are shaped by changes in the demographic, social, cultural, economic, environmental, governance, and institutional pattern of a system. So it keeps on changing over time. And when we talk about systemic vulnerability, it, it not only changes over time, but it's all, it is also linked across societies, across regions. So we've seen that when we talk about COVID-19. And the system was so much connected that with COVID-19, which was, uh, which happened and people thought it was a health crisis only. We've seen it's not only a health crisis, it has become a social and economic crisis as well because of the health containment measures, people couldn't go to work and mainly those in the informal sector couldn't go to work. So they were most vulnerable uh, for many countries and many African countries having uh, a high share of their population operating in the informal sector, they were the most vulnerable. So one shock leading to other shocks within the system. So when we talk about vulnerability now, we will also refer to systemic vulnerability, where it is the dependence of human societies on the ecosystem services, right? So it's very important to consider systemic vulnerability as well. Now, before performing any vulnerability assessment, there are three questions that we need to answer. Who and how many people are vulnerable? This will give us more information when we will be allocating, uh, making decision about resource allocation, right? So we need to know who and how many people are vulnerable, who are they, and how many are they, where are they. This will improve geographic targeting. Where are they, in which areas, uh, in which geographical location? Why are they vulnerable? This will help in understanding what type of interventions are required, right? For which reasons? are they vulnerable, then we can target intervention into these causes of vulnerability. The different vulnerable groups, we did mention them. There are many, and we could be adding more to that list. We've included informal workers, seasonal workers, families with members, uh, being sick, chronic illness, where it implies high medical costs, inability to work. Them. Therefore, these conditions make them vulnerable. People with disabilities uh, who cannot work, do not have any kind of earning opportunities. Women, female-headed household, single parents, divorced women who are very vulnerable if they can't participate in the labor market. 
or they participate in the informal sector. So then they do not have a fixed income. So seasonal income, which makes them uh, or volatile income, which make them vulnerable. The elderly uh, who are also vulnerable because they do not have a source of income from work or any kind of economic activities. They can, imp uh, they can be in the informal sector, but sometimes they are sick, they are disabled, so there are increased care burdens there. Children aged under five years who are vulnerable because of undernutrition, malnutrition, or affected by diseases, infectious diseases. So there are a number of categories, uh, mothers as well, so can be vulnerable because of undernutrition, especially pregnant mothers. Uh, in many circumstances, they tend to be highly vulnerable if they don't get the medical services needed. So there are a number of vulnerable groups and these vulnerable groups will be most affected by shocks or stresses. Whenever we, we do the vulnerability assessment, right, to get a global, a holistic understanding of vulnerability dynamics that can be used to identify specific risk, there are other questions that we need to answer. What is the extent of vulnerability? Who is the vulnerable? Who are they? We've discussed about them. What is the extent of their vulnerability? To what extent are they vulnerable? What are the sources of vulnerability? We discussed that. So what are the causes of this vulnerability? But there are other things which we didn't answer in our three elements that we, we discussed before, is how do they respond to these shocks? This is very important. How do these households respond to these shocks? What gaps exist between the risk that they are facing and the management mechanism present? Yeah, so the risk they are facing is one thing, but how do they manage the risk? What, what strategies do they have? What options are there to mitigate this risk on them? So the selection of vulnerability assessment methods is very important. It depends on what is the aim of your assessment, what is the focus of the assessment. There are many assessment methods used uh, in many countries or internationally by many international institutions. They tend to have, if you look at vulnerability index, you do a search on the internet, you will have many indices, right? But at the end of the day, it depends as to the objective of your study and what is the focus, what is the purpose, what do you want to achieve after doing that assessment. So also another element which is very important, what is the level of your analysis? Is it being done at the micro level, household level or macro level? So these questions need to be answered first before choosing the method. Another element, will you adopt a qualitative approach or a quantitative approach? Or you will adopt a mixed method with both qualitative and quantitative approaches. All depend on the data you have. And whenever you do an assessment, it's also costly. So do you have time to undertake surveys? Do you have the funds to do the surveys? Do you have uh, the data already there, will you be using secondary data or will you be collecting data? So these questions need to be answered before you undertake a vulnerability assessment because it could be highly quantitative where you will be using indicators, yeah? But it could be also qualitative. So which methods or will it be both where we talk about a mixed approach? So this is something which we took from Moret 2014, which explained well, what is the purpose of your analysis? Is it at the level of household, 
Is it at the level of the community? And are you taking population level, household level? What are the data needs? What kind of indicators will you be using? Uh, and also, what is the focus? Are you focusing on vulnerability to poverty? Are you focusing on food security? Are you focusing on HIV AIDS or any other health concern? Are you focusing on natural hazard? So all these dimensions are very important. We need to know your focus, your level of analysis. Why are you doing that assessment? What are the data that you need? And then you can generate a number of indicators. The method there, there are a number of, in, uh, a number of indices, sorry. The method there could be you can derive the livelihood vulnerability index. There are a number of, of, of indices which are there in the literature, which countries have applied, and you can have a look at them. So at the start, you need to make sure the focus, what is the focus, what is the level, what is the purpose, the level of analysis, and your data needs. So what are the various tools which you have? You can do a rapid assessment using particip participatory tools where you can use a group of people, experts, and get their views. You can interview stakeholders. You can have expert panels discussing on vulnerability in your country, in your community. You can do a livelihood analysis also. You can have focus group discussion with people in a community. A group of people based on age, gender, uh, or working people in terms of employment status. You can engage in household surveys, yeah, or use data from household surveys already published by your local statistical office. You can have brainstorming sessions with uh, governmental officers, private sectors, or non-governmental organizations. So it could be different tools that you use. It could be national surveys as well, or census data, which are often used sometimes to do this kind of analysis if you have the census data for your country. So there are, I would say, an extensive number of tools to, to assess vulnerability, but all depend on what data or what tools you can afford and what data is there for your country, or you can engage in primary data collection given uh, the time you have and given the funds you have. We have been taking a few examples of vulnerability assessment indices uh, in the handout which we, we will be giving you. We, I think we have three examples there, but I'll be focusing on one, especially the Commonwealth Universal Vulnerability Index, because I think it's very comprehensive. Why did we choose this one? because it has the vulnerability dimension as well as the resilience dimension. But it may be applicable for some countries, but it might not be for others. It depends on the data you have and the specificities of your country. What we like about the, the UVI, I would say, is that resilience dimension, but at the same time, it tries to cover a number of vulnerability dimension, economic, vulnerability, climatic, physical vulnerability, socio-political vulnerability, yeah? So it talks about structural vulnerability as well as resilience. And the resilience will look at not only the structure of the economy, social infrastructure and the demography, but also in terms of policy, governance, institution, regulatory framework, which are key for many African countries. So 
before we get to the next slide, we have vulnerability resilience. And then within vulnerability, it is split in terms of the different dimension, economic, climatic, sociopolitical, and resilience also is split into two dimensions. Once we split in dimensions, like what we did, dimensions of vulnerability, economic vulnerability to external and natural shocks, this one, we need to split that into indicators, right? So economic vulnerability, we can measure it by looking at economic indicators like uh, export concentration index, right? Trade dependence index or instability in exports, share of agriculture, instability of import values. So I can use different indicators to measure the different dimensions. And what we, we do is try to see what is the link with vulnerability. That is, if there is greater instability in trade, then vulnerability is likely to be higher. So there is a positive link. That's why in the loss column, you will see positive. Yeah. Then we come to the climate change. That is the physical vulnerability to climate change. In this case, we can include indicators like rainfall, temperature, storms, flooding, etc. The higher risk of high, having floods or high temperature or high rainfall, then the higher will be the vulnerability of the population. Again, there is a positive link there, right? So what we need to do whenever we do a vulnerability assessment is to get the dimensions right. And with the dimension, make sure we can measure these dimension in terms of indicators. Once we get the indicators, we try to link it with vulnerability and see what is the link. Is it positive or negative, right? Like we just said, higher rainfall or higher flooding, greater risk of flooding means higher vulnerability, greater risk associated with uh, temperature shocks or cyclones, then the higher the vulnerability. So this is how we should be proceeding. Get the dimensions, get the indicators, and then see what's the link with vulnerability. The other uh, dimension of a UVI is internal violence index. That is looking at, for example, criminality, uh, terrorism, political violence, regional violence. If you have data on that, for, for example, um, number of terrorist incidents, uh, number of deaths due to terrorism or homicide rate for 100,000 inhabitants. So if you have data on that, you can measure that dimension. Of course, then you can link it with vulnerability. Higher number of terrorist incidents or death means higher vulnerability of the population, means they are insecure. Then we come to resilience. The structural resilience dimension is also important because it tells you, let's say, the more educated your population is, then the more likely they will be able to design measures or to be resilient to the impact of, of hazard or shocks, right? That is, you will put together your knowledge and try to build a capacity of communities to face the consequences of shocks. So higher education uh, with higher average years of schooling or adult literacy rate being very high will reduce your vulnerability to shocks and stresses. So once you talk about structural resilience, you should get your indicators to measure that dimension of resilience. It could be in terms of education, as I just mentioned, health, share of population working, 
the higher the share population working means lower vulnerability because they have a source of income and can face mitigate the effects of the of the shock demographic structure if you have low number of refugees which means that they are the vulnerable groups you reduce the number of people within the vulnerable groups so you reduce vulnerability a structural market connectivity looks at structural resilience so one indicator could be market potential the higher the market potential that means the more you can trade your your country is growing in terms of gross domestic product gdp then you're less vulnerable to shocks right so these indicators are key to measure the different dimension and can link it to the vulnerability situation. So in the handout, you have other examples, uh, which I would, I would advise to look at, especially the informed risk index and the UNDP multidimensional vulnerability index. They are important indices which you can apply to your own country, uh, but also which you can amend to apply uh, to your own country based on different specificities of your country. So I would advise looking at these different indices and have a look at the indicators which are used there to measure the different dimensions under the vulnerability assessment and see whether you have that data for your own country and whether you can apply or you can embark on a vulnerability assessment in a given area uh, for your country or community. So this is the end of module two, which looked at risk uh, assessment and analysis, also vulnerability assessment and analysis. Thank you.